and he pulls up my numbers and my hard ball gets normally would be might be say four and then my loose ball gets might be 10 or 12. And Lee goes, well, Aki, you've got no hard ball gets at all. Naturally, in my brain, I'm like, that is strange, Lee. And then I thought, but if you really think about it, Lee, as I sort of stopped for a second, I said, if you think about it, what I was doing, I was getting my pace. I said, because, you know, contested ball, hard ball gets, it must be like a player around you. Is that, is that correct? And he goes, that's right. I said, well, there are players around, Lee, but by the time I get to the ball <laughs> and I disappear... I've turned that hard ball get into a fucking loose ball get. <laughs> Let's go. I look behind me, the fucking Scott brothers, the uh, Litchi, Vossi, they're all rolling in the aisles, and I thought, oh, shit, did I just say that? that that's yeah, going to sound good. as arrogant as arrogant, but, you know, yeah, that's, well. that's the way I thought. And that was this week's guest, Jason Akamanis. Welcome to the one-on-one football podcast. My name is Andrew Rains. I'm the CEO and founder of one-on-one football, and I've got my co-host here again today, Harry Simington. How are you going, Harry? Good mate, yeah, really good. We just fin- finished filming the um, and recording, sorry, the the second episode of the year. We've had obviously one episode um, with just the two of us last week, and and now we've um, yeah had Akron. He was a um, a real character, and uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a different style of interview, which um, I think the the listeners will really enjoy. Yeah, exactly, mate. It was a really good interview, and um, you just finished up a recording as you just mentioned. Um, what can listeners sort of look forward to in this um, today's episode? Yeah, so obviously Ak has had a, um, a a great career, and we um, we talk about the three premierships, the the, the Brownlow Medal as well, and um, and sort of in that success era with the Brisbane Lions and um, Lee Matthews as a coach and Phil Jauncey in their sports psychology, we, he sort of um, he gave us heaps of heaps of little stories and insights into that into that era, and um, I think um, I think that's valuable not only for for players but coaches as well, and sort of understanding what builds a um, a successful um, successful team and. Um, he, he sort of went into depth as well on, on what makes a good teammate and, um, and, and some of the characteristics that he valued with um, Simon Black and, and the likes. Um, then also, yeah, some advice to young players on how to develop their game, some, um, some personality traits that, um, that, that holds them in good stead and also um, how to kick on your opposite foot and the importance of that, um, which was obviously something that, um, that he was known for throughout his career. Yeah, and just incredible. The thing I love about Acker is, um, again, uh, played against him, didn't get an opportunity to play with him. The lines have come a bit after, but the things I hear about him is it's just what I love if, about his character is that just like obviously he's, he's he was fairly maligned. I think a lot of people obviously saw him in the media and he's you know obviously quite outspoken and things like that. But I think he he obviously backed it up. His his performances just spoke you know sort of about the type of player he was and he backed up and loved that pressure situation but he wasn't afraid yeah. to you know sort of say what he, he thought and, and, and if he pissed off someone you know at the end of the day it doesn't matter because he was so strong in his values and that came out yeah. really strongly in this podcast and I, I really respect him for that the other one too I, I, I really respect him for is just um, you know he's he got a lot of ta- he's got a lot of talent and we talk about that a fair bit on the podcast he's got talent but if you if you mix talent with the work ethic and and what he talks about too is that grunt and desire i reckon that's that number one quality that makes um you know sort of bridges a gap between you know everyone in the afl is really talented but he's got that a bit of that mongrel and aggressiveness that that really you know sort of set him apart that he wants to be the best um i just i really really that sort of honed in on on and that for me and i really um i really think that's you know really important for our listeners to um you know sort of educate themselves on and and that's the man he was yeah, absolutely. He's um he's, he's got a great attitude on on football. So I think um the listeners, as always, are in for a real treat. And uh, without further ado, this is episode number eighteen with Jason Akamanis. You're listening to the One on One Football Podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie rules training, coaching, and development tips. Jason Akamanis, thanks for joining us, mate, and welcome to the show. Hey, Harry. G'day, Rangy. How are you boys uh, on this lovely Friday? We're recording on a Friday. It's always good Fridays. We're going well, buddy. We're going well. Thanks for um, obviously joining us, mate. Um, I just thought I'd get you on board. Obviously, no better uh, person to um, have a bit of a chinwag with, mate. Um, and looking forward to sort of delving into a few questions. Um, give us the audience a bit of an update on your on your life at the moment, mate. Where are you? And um, yeah, give us a bit of a rundown of the last couple of years. 
Yeah, last couple of years have been pretty uh, eventful, I think. I was in a little place called Albury, which is uh, pretty cold at the best of times. It was a nice summers there and playing lots of golf and had a couple of businesses there. So I came back home here. I did my full licence and auctioneering licence, which means I could work back here in Queensland. And then I work, actually started down the road here, which is like literally 40 metres that way, a place called Ray White Ascot. And then I left them after about four months and went out on my own. So I've got... My own property business here, Jason Ackermanis Properties, which is uh, with Blue Moon, which are up the coast, they're a big group. And uh, so we're in real estate, do lots of auctions and, you know, selling everyone's house and and, uh, and units, whatever we can get our hands on, really. And then, of course, doing lots of rentals, which has been a crazy big business for us. And so we have also in that period when I was in Albury, we had, I did coaching there, got a degree in coaching, and then we had AR, which is augmented reality. So that product you'll see this year, and then another product called Zucoins, which is going to be the world's first worldwide currency, legal tender uh, cryptocurrency. So, you know, I didn't build it, but you know, I was involved with the guys who did, and and those guys being startups, you know, you got to get them going. But we had a great software engineer a guy called Robert Novak, so he's built that, and that's about the start. So that'll. I'm sure that'll allow me to buy a lot more property in the future. Just got into the uh, crypto, mate. It's uh, an exciting space. It's, uh, it's good to hear. Yeah, there's 7,000 cryptos, though, and I think most of them. I mean, when you've got a product like ours, which is like a couple of decades ahead, it's it's always really hard to tell people, look, it's like, it's like when you had Motorola, Nokia, and then the iPhone came. You know, there's always something that's going to supersede it. Obviously, you've still got, you know, a few big players, and, and I think with all cryptos, there will only be a couple left because in reality there's only a need for a couple of them even in the world today. So, yeah, ZooCoins is uh, it's certain um, the best bit about ZooCoins, I tell people, so this week, just earlier this week, uh, Facebook were going to come out with a product which, which was identical to ours they were going to build called Diem. Anyway, they've quit on that. So they had uh, many, many millions of dollars and they couldn't get it done. But we knew when they were going to do that particular product years ago that we'd already developed it. So we weren't worried, but we knew that they would be our closest competitor as far as software software build and they haven't even got close. So good news, good news, yeah, good news there. But you have to be, a bit, there's a bit of luck in that. Yeah, luck. exactly. Oh, mate, you sound like a very busy man with your, with your finger on the pulse and... Um we were talking before, mate, about um, some of the guests that we've we've had on the show previously, and unfortunately, you're not the first Brownlow medalist we've had. Um, sure. Shame I won't beat you to it, but you're. Um... Well, I am the most imp- important one, you know. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Blackie. Yeah. Speaking of Blackie, you're the first triple premiership player, so you'll you'll uh, you'll have that one over him. You did we did beat him for two of them? Didn't? We? Oh no, that wasn't Shane. That was you had Josh Fraser on where we beat him out for two. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. And we'll get into that one. I'm looking forward to hearing the uh, stories of uh, those those flags, mate. He's probably still got nightmares about it, Paul Josh. <laughs> <laughs> he did kick out a very key goal late in the 2002 grand final, which got him really back in the game. And, man, they were a bit unlucky there. Rockers go mm. on, a few other things. And obviously, they were. we got over the line, but that was a close one. Man, that was a close one. Yeah, for sure. A real, real um, success here for the Lions. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, mate. But just in a broad sense, now that you've had a bit of a um, time to step away from footy, how, how do you look back on your career and your achievements now that you've sort of had a chance to reflect? Well, I think the good thing for me, like I'd been born in Mildura. Uh, my mum was from Brisbane. So we came back here in sort of 86. So it's always played Aussie rules, played for a place called Maine or, or a team called Maine. Great team, really strong in that era. They were the biggest uh, QAFL club for a long time. We used to have grand finals here. I think they're in like second or third or fourth division or something now, which is always a shame. But uh, to play there, I, I mean, for me, I came to Brisbane, never heard of rugby league, rugby union. Uh, the boys are a bit big and rough for me. I was I was quite a lean kid with red hair, and, and obviously I, I loved using my pace to dance around them and, and using my foot skills and, and the things I had was obviously wonderful at. So for me to look back in my career, I always think, you know, it's not me that said it, but, you know, it's always great when you hear, you know, Mike Sheen say, look, he's the best kick ever played. And I've had great coaches in my era, some bad ones as well. We had some good ones. You said, you're the best finisher ever played in front of goal and stuff like that. And it always warms your heart that all that work you do, and we all we all work hard, but to have that extra little bit of genetics, uh, I think Michael Voss gave me the, the ultimate compliment. He said, you know, you got everything out of your DNA. You, no one... You couldn't have done any more with what the gods gave you, even though it was wonderful, you, incredible endurance, but great speed and skill. But you've used that to your your best advantage. And I think obviously the flags, everyone, you know, we all play for flags. Um, but you know, to have a team that we had in two thousand one, two, three, and nearly two thousand four, that was a wonderful team. 
arguably the best in that era. It was really hard to put into words just how, you know, when you're there, it just feels like another day. But when you look back and I see those guys now, we had the 20-year reunion late last year and the guys who could come that live locally, we went up and played golf and there were six of us. And, man, that was the funniest and, and the best weekend I've had for a long time outside of my family time. So it, it's, it is good. It's a very a special feeling you have because it's, it's such a unique team. But uh, also to win like a Brownlow in that period, we had Simon Black the next year. But people don't realise, we had like Michael Voss, who was a superstar. I mean, he finished third in two of those Brownlow years and he, he was on one leg most of those that time. So just an amazing group, amazing time. But, you know, I look back and footy, like it is for you, Rainsy, uh, it's been, you know, a vehicle if you can use it, not just mm. during your footy, but after footy. But... I mean, talking about the zoo coins, that would never have happened if I didn't leave the bulldog. Uh, sorry, the the lions to go to the bulldogs and twist the fate that that is, and that's that's what footy can do. And if you're you're listening and learn, you know you're you're keeping out for the network, it's so huge. You should always take advantage of it because it's it's pretty unique. It's massive. My actually wife talks about that a fair bit. She says, says oh, a lot of. Um the old cliche is go to a private school and you meet all the contacts you, you know you'd ever ever imagine and she said uh play afl football and you'll have all the contacts um you know forever and it's a it's a fair fair comment which is which is unbelievable and now i do the same thing you sort of look back in the people you meet and the twist of fate and all that sort of stuff uh mate so it's um yeah good to, good to sort of know back to sort of when you were a kid just trying to identify when and a lot of our listeners are sort of that younger age at the moment um did you always have sort of the ability, um, you know, sort of coming through the ranks? I mean, obviously, you worked your absolute butt off to sort of get to what you achieved, but did you always have, you spoke about your speed and skill and things like that, um, and did you always love the game? Yeah, well, I love kicking goals, and I would do that <laughs> most of the time. And because I was such a fast runner, like I was really good at athletics, so that was easy. I always enjoyed that those two parts of the game. The endurance side wasn't really my strength. I mean, I was a champion 400-meter runner. <laughs> running one lap is different to running back and forth all bloody day or, or doing those longer time trials. But, like, I was playing in the States as an 11-year-old under 12s. Uh, Clark Keating, who lives around the corner here, is always coming down, and we, we do lots of business together. Him and I were in that state to play in the premierships together. But, you know, that goes back, you know, 30, 35 years, you know, or 30 years so it's a long time. So I, I think the the skill was there, but, you know, as a kid, oh, I'm not a lazy kid, but, I, you know, you, you certainly learn to work hard. When you, I think that only really happened. I mean, I wasn't a big fan of training at the best of times. And coming through that period, we had some horrible, horrible junior coaches. You know, we had Happy Wallace who trained us at 15 like we are in the AFL. Um, we had, uh, you know, we had uh, a couple of other guys that were in under 14s and 16s that trained us like lunatics. So for me, I got lucky. I missed all of uh, the year when I was 15. I had a bad head injury, nearly died. So I had a blood clot and I couldn't play. You know, a blood clot in your brain is pretty, pretty uh, detrimental. So having that year off, it kind of worked in my favour because it got back my fire in my belly. But I also had a chance to, uh, one, I nearly had it all taken away, but then two... I didn't really burn out. And I know a lot of guys that I play with, there's probably two players that played in Queensland, both Redheads actually, who should have gone on to AFL lists, who were just superstars. And I think then them playing all the way through, they just really lost a little bit of that passion. So by the time I came back, I'm 16, I make the state team again. I, you know, I'd made all the state teams all the way through that. So, you, you know, you, the number one player from like under 12s in your age group there's a guy called Michael Voss who's like two years older than me and he's dominating, he's 15 years of age on an AFL list. I mean, this is this is unheard of. So in that era, as you came through, they had bigger lists. Uh, it wasn't great money or anything, but what you could do, you could get local guys. So when I got to 16, I started playing against men all the time at Maine. So, and I'm getting tagged, which is always great fun. I'd been tagged my whole life, but you know, it didn't really worry me, except now I'm playing against you know big, strong men and I had a guy in here today, one of my mates who sells photocopies, who was in those teams, and he would come around, him and his brother, the Tap brothers, would come and beat the crap out of the guys who were on me. And, you know, for me, growing up in that era, it's pretty, still pretty rough era. Uh, they didn't have cameras at every game. There wasn't all this sort of, you know, you see today, you get a sort of a drive-by and you get a little clip in the bloody in the chops and all of a sudden you're out for a week. Well, back then you wouldn't even look at it. And, of course, that was the era when... 
get everyone from the opposition off because, you know, they helped us a year ago or two years ago. Like, it was a crazy era. So for me, at 16, to play the under-17s, the Bears had invited me to, to their training in the preseason. Nathan Buckley was on the list at that stage. So I got a real taste for just the skill side, of which even at that age was still dominating. Like, I was still going really well. Uh, with Wolsey, though, you know, he was the coach at the time. They would have, they'd start off with 10 200s and it would get to 22 over the weeks. You'd have full contact training, like this is pre-Christmas. You'd do 45 minutes of just handball games and stuff. Then you'd have sort of some lighter skill drills and that'd go for an hour. And then at the end, the midfielders would go and all run 5Ks. we come back. And I got to see that. And here I am playing now in the ones, playing against men. So by the time I play against 17s, again, for Queensland against all the other kids, I went from being beaten up to doing the beaten up, which is very uh, strange because I wasn't the biggest guy. But I was so used to the contact. Get an All-Australian jumper. Getting an All-Australian jumper for a Queensland kid is not that common. So that was pretty cool. That era and that particular team, there's, I don't know how many of them, most of that team went on and played in the AFL. They were all on AFL lists. And so that was, that was my introduction. Obviously, the Bears picked me up. Um, so at 17, I'm, you know, I go on and, and I'm playing and already been in that system. So the Bears, naturally, back then they could pick you up like an academy pick. So I played the year before against a guy called Leo Barry. Now, Leo Barry was the same size at 17 as he was in the AFL. He was a huge man. He played against me on the wing, fast and strong. Man, he completely obliterated me. I thought I was going right. And, and then you got to see the, the other kids. And he, he went on to play for City, so they pick him up as a New South Wales Riverina kid. Myself, Fossey, Clark Keating, a guy called Brent Green, really good juniors, all get picked up for Brisbane. So we never even went in the draft, so you wouldn't even know where we went. But that was the era, that was the days when you could do that. And that's, it was good for me because I still was, I was going into year 12 when they picked me up late in 94. So I, I started playing around 495, but I'm going to Nudgee College, which is a famous rugby union school. They hated me because, you know, I'm on an athletic scholarship, I'm not paying to go there. And four rounds in, none of my classmates at all had any idea I'm about to go and play uh, my very first AFL game. So th that's what it was like for me. It's incredible that too, isn't it? So much hype around the draft these days as kids come through. Straight up, I think, and similar sort of top of play, and I hope he can get to, to somewhere close to your levels is Isaac Rankin at the Suns. And I just sort of look back to watching him come through. Obviously, I worked through those talent academy periods and you watch you know get young guns like him coming through. And it sounds like your upbringing is a tiny bit different. You talk about getting whacked around the chops and playing a bit more local footy against men and things like that. I just wonder these days if the kids aren't sort of exposed to that sort of, you know, not the old school stuff, but a bit more sort of physicality. And because obviously when you, you know, obviously start to establish yourself, you would have been targeted a fair bit and you're probably ready for it. Yeah, in a way, I think with, I mean, I, I like him too, Rankin. He's a good player. I hope he goes on. And I actually found when you play at the, the senior level, even now for him, I would argue when he goes back, it's quite a more physical game at the lower levels than it is at the high level because so much faster. Yeah, they hit you harder, but of course, by the time the ball comes in your area, you get so used to getting it, giving it, it's gone. Where at the lower levels, you know, you got a bit more time to get to the ball. There's more guys around the ball. They they sort of tend to make it a lot harder for you. So I think, I think it's still there in some capacity. But no doubt, having been younger, playing against the men, and I'd always had to play up. So in in Queensland, like the the talent wasn't anywhere near like it is today. So you'd always have to play not just the next year, but two years up. So I'd play in the 10s, 12s and 14s. They're always big kids. So for me, it was uh, it was sort of, I hated it, but it was the best ever uh, ground to get, get into the AFL. And I think I did find it hard the odd time that I had to go back down to the QAFL level or even when I, you know, late in my career when I had to, got injured, I had to go back and play at the VFL level. Man, they, they were pretty tough games. You get tagged and... Yeah, it is hard. You got to earn your own ball. You're not you're not quite be able to do what you normally do. So it's it is different. You don't have the crowd giving you a G up as well. So yeah, it's tough. But I think he'll still make it because he's got the talent. But if he he was a midfielder going forward and kicking goals and getting his endurance going, he's got everything else he needs. And mm. sometimes you wonder, do you you know where he's at? 
is it the right fit? You know, there's lots of mm. talent, but, you know, in another system he may thrive, which has happened, unfortunately, in a lot of Gold Coast kids, you know. Well, that's the thing, too, yeah. and you sort of reflect it. It just sounds like he obviously had Vossi. I mean, he was obviously a couple of years older, but, and, and the, the, Bears, the Bears obviously weren't flying at the time, but they still had that solid sort of senior group, and that's why I think sometimes with the Suns, you sort of look and they go, well, who are they? Who's, who's it? Like, you use Rankin for that example. Who's... Who's he actually? Who's mentoring him? Who's you know? Who's who's his role model? Who's training hard with him? Who's you know sort of driving those standards consistently with, with him? And, and you often think that. And obviously, you you probably had that at Brisbane coming through. We did. So ninety five, our first year, we actually won the last seven out of eight games. We got into the finals. We played Carlton, and that, they won that year. But we're the only team that got within Cooey of them. And back then, it was like first versus eighth. And people often ask me about that year, but. People don't realise we had uh, this really strong, much older experience and generally from other teams, senior players come through uh, to our side. So we had like Andrew Buse, for example. Mm. Now the rat... Tough as uh, nails. The rat. rat is an amazing trainer and he taught all of us uh, don't go drinking with him because he's a lunatic when he drinks. Rats but actually jumped on board in in on the on the system in Geelong. He uh, yeah he he, he, got, yeah, he jumped on board last. He's always week. out, you know. He's still down there doing training. He's yeah. a complete lunatic, and we loved him. And what he taught us was and Craig Lambert, Craig Lambert, who would always get the best tag, like he's a superstar, Craig, and he would explain to us, Vossi and myself and Blackie and Nige, what it's like and the compliment that it is to be tag where normally you, you're mentally like oh here we go again i got this you know this bloke is a dribbler can't get a kick and if i make a mistake he might get a kick well andrew and say lynchy was there by then uh he, they'd been there sort of a couple of years but they would teach us about all the things that you you just think about now and you think oh what, why am i taking that powder and why am i looking at that supplement well, Andrew Buse would be the guy. I mean, he, he, you'd sit in there and he'd have all these potions. He'd have this powder. He'd get out this green powder, which tastes like complete dog shit. And he'd go, I, and we'd say, what's that, rat? And he'd go, mate, this this helps your endurance. This is uh, ultra muscle ease. This does this, this. Next minute, you know, you know, me, Chris Scott, Vossi, Leper, you know, all the blokes who are underneath trying to come through, good players, we're all having the same stuff. And that that... That's our experience that we had. And that, I suppose, for us to have those leaders was actually just as important as it was the years later, having all that team in their prime. Mm. Lammy missed out on all those premierships, but he was a coach at the time. But I can guarantee you he had just as much influence yeah. being a coach than he would have out in the ground. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, for sure. And, and, mate, you mentioned all the senior players there that were obviously setting the example. And, and we know as a young player, you've, you, you sort of go on a journey to – not only earn your place in the starting 22, but also earn respect from the senior players. How did you go about earning that respect? Was there anything that sticks out in your mind as a, as a, as a way that you earned respect from those senior players? Yeah, I remember this one particular day. There's, there's two incidents. One, I was in a drill and I ended up getting Marcus Ashcroft, who, Choppers, who was a great leader, really, really good endurance runner, highly skilled, you know, and I ended up sort of half flattening you know, this is my very first year in the pre-season. And Choppers looked up and he could see it was me. And, of course, you know, Choppers not a very violent guy. He's n not a fighter. But he, he made sure that, you know, I wasn't... Him being probably 25 at this age, uh, this stage, and, and a very, very good AFL player, well, he isn't going to cop that from a, you know, rookie. So next minute, we're, you know, we're punching on. And, and all of a sudden, I, with like just like that, though, Choppers, he wouldn't say it, but... That was okay. And the older, experienced players, you're sort of making, not fools of them, but you're, you're doing so well in training. They're not liking it. Like, I'd walk in, and because I talk all the time, you know, for me, it's what I do. I do, how are you going? What's happening? Players are coming over to me and say, you can't do that. This is the rules. It's, it's like this unwritten law. And, of course, I was in there going, well, I don't care. I'm here. I'm here. My right to be here is just the same as yours. So I had senior players already offside, Yet in, same, in the same breath, they also had to accept me for being the different person that I was in off-field. Anyway, Wolsey, in my first year, late in the first year, we used to have this, uh, this drill. And Wolsey had these couple of crazy drills. One's called the channel, would run from half-back. He'd have just two channels of about 20 metres apart, straight down to the goals, three on three, full on. This is like midweek, between games. And then he had this other one called the handball square, which most of us have done where there's four, four, you know, four guys, four cones, three guys in the middle. Anyway, I didn't know this at the time. This is before training. But that particular drill, Wolsey had teed up two of the biggest guys in our team. So uh, one was Dion Scott. Dion Scott's probably 
198 centimetres, is a big man. He's centre, centre half forward, 105, 110 kilos, big guy. And then we had Maxi Kennedy. Now, Matty Kennedy is like, at this stage, he's a mobile wingman, six foot four, 195 centimetres. Big Maxi, mad as mad. Anyway, Wolsey had teed him up before training, right? So we have this handball square drill. I go in and I made the rookie error of being one of the last, because uh, you only went through once, because it's a, it's a really uh, torturous drill. And you go in and it feels like you're there for five minutes, but it's probably, you know, a minute. I go in there and there's three of us in there. We're trying to get the ball. And my back's turned to where the ball is. And, and I get completely like uh, just shoulder charged from behind. It's like it hits me. And of course, next minute I'm flat on the ground. And because you're already pretty gassed in this drill. We'd already done all these other drills. End of training, last drill. I'm on the ground. I get up. I'm like, what the fuck? Didn't know who that was. But Dion Scott had just lined me up. Anyway, the drill goes on, and I'm trying to get the ball, and blokes, you know, big bodies are, are, are still, like I'm 72 kilos still at this day, so I'm not, you know, I'm sort of 82 now, but, and played most of my career at 79, 80. Anyway, Maxi takes me in. I'm on the ground. Like, now I'm, like, nearly unconscious. This is, like, and I'm fatigued. So I get up, drill finishes, and I've got this headache, and I'm like, oh, my God. So I, I start walking out of this drill. You wouldn't believe it, because it was the last two guys so you need three in this drill. Two guys go in. And Wolsey, because Wolsey had this thing. Wolsey was all about toughness. Like, you know, never cutting corners. All the things, like Wolsey on the field wasn't a particularly strong player. He wasn't as physical as he probably could have been. But as a coach, it was all the things he wasn't as a player. It's a bit like Lee. Lee was a nutcase on diet, skin folds. So clearly, uh, coaches just have their things where it's nearly like they're all like, whatever they're not good at, they focus in on. <laughs> and Wolsey, <laughs> Wolsey was like a lunatic for this. And he goes, oh, good, Aka, go back in again. I go back in again. I'm already gassed. I'm already stuffed. My legs, my, my quads are burning. Anyway, Maxi and, and Dion get, hit me again. And this goes on. Now I'm like half unconscious. My, my, my feet don't work anymore. Wolsey goes, okay, end of the, end of the training. And they, everyone starts running off. And, of course, I'm still like... On the ground, I can't move. And I look up, and there by now, where we were outside the rooms, which is the old social club at the Gabba, they're nearly up near the point post. And Michael Voss is the only player of us. He, he ran all the way back, and he, he put his arm around me. And it wasn't even like he had to say anything. He was just like, guys, it's all right. So he takes me back up there. But that was the way Wolsey would do it. And so when you think about those, those two examples, uh, yet... Out of that, out of that one experience, even in that drill late in the year, now I wasn't as tough as I, I would go on to, you know, win my own ball and be our best tackler and all that. I was none of those things. But Wolsey and the other players after that, oh, sweet. Because mm -hmm. then they were like, okay, you got to put up with that shit from him. You could take that from Dion Scott and Maxie Kennedy and they're big dudes. All, all credit to you, no problem. And after that, never an issue. It's amazing, isn't it? It's sort of just that sort of... Um it's like a, a bit of an induction and, and you sort of get through it. And I think, um, I don't know, just these days I reckon they lack a bit of that. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's called a bit old school and, and obviously there's some things these days that you sort of, you know, there's always strength conditioning by us getting involved and say so can't do certain drills. But I'm a big believer of those, um, you know, sort of first uh, first impressions. Obviously they last too and, and, and putting you through the ring and nothing wrong with that, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. And I remember uh, just to finish that whole sequence at the end of the year, this is before we were on our big run, Wall's here, as he was, you know, he's the type of guy, I remember, that when we'd have edits back in the old days, so when you, you completely either shit yourself or you'd go back with the flight and, you, you know, you weren't as tough as he'd like, he would, like, uh, stop it, rewind it and play it again. And then he'd do, he'd do that four or five times, right? Anyway, we get beaten this one day, badly beaten. We're always getting beaten. And Wall's is like, you guys aren't fit enough. So Wall's decides on the Monday... Straight after, you know, two days after the game, playing on Saturday afternoon, we go over to where the old cricketers club is, which used to look like something out of the West, and, West Indies, wonderful old Queenslander. We'd start there, you run all the way around the Gabba, and you'd finish at the point post. Anyway, we had to do 12 of them. And we start running, and of course, I'm, I'm a good runner, so I'm up near the front, and everything's going fine. And We get to sort of about number six or seven, so now we're, we're fatigued, but we're getting closer to the end. And Wolsey, this is the kind of guy he was... He noticed one of the, our teammates, a guy called Nathan Chapman. Chappie ended up going overseas and punning for the Green Bay 
uh, Packers, brilliant kick on the ball. Not the not the best endurance athlete you've ever seen. Anyway, Chappie, unfortunately, was completely stuffed. Uh, he was running, but he had started to creep on the inside. And, and, of course, we have the boundary line, and he's on the inside of the boundary line. Wolsey sees this, and he's had enough. And this is the type of don't-cut corners that Wolsey was, which is a very good skill to learn. Anyway, <laughs> Chappie is running around. We all run past, and I notice Wolsey. Wolsey being six foot five, he's not really... A, hard man to miss, plus he's very intimidating. And he comes over to where we sort of were running past. Thankfully, uh, us guys at the front were running on the outside of the line. Anyway, Chappie's sort of dead last coming around, and he's probably three or four metres on the inside. And Wolsey takes one of the biggest steps you've ever seen and just hits him with a, sh- a hip and shoulder right to the chest. And Chappie was already gassed. And Chap- all we hear is this, oh, and then <laughs> we look behind us. And here's Chappie on the ground. <laughs> and Wolsey standing over and going, don't run on this fucking side of the line again. Well, we did the last five or whatever it was, and Chappie was nearly in the crowd. He was running that far away from the, the, the line. It wasn't funny. But that's Wolsey's do not cut corners. You can't cut corners. You've got to do it the hard way. And that group, the majority of that group that grew into the premiership teams, always remember that. Yeah, and I pr- probably wouldn't get away with that these days. But again, I think it's you know some of that stuff I don't think isn't anything wrong with, which is um, and sounds like obviously it set you guys up for that for that future. But um, mate, just just shifting a bit more towards a su- specific part of the game and educating our listeners, um, we're all about on this show, um, and particular insights to certain skills. Um, no doubt the ability to kick um, both feet was second to none. Um, did you always have? Were you always good on your left foot? And how much practice or you know sort of um. Did you, did you do growing up? And, and what's your advice for young kids these days are trying to focus on their sort of opposite foot or, or working on it? Well, the irony is uh, for all the nearly every session I've ever done a one-on-one coaching for you guys is always on kicking. It's the hardest skill in footy and it's probably arguably the worst taught and the, the misunder, probably most misunderstood skill. Yet it's technically not that difficult to get right. So I think for me... My very first coach, very first training session, I'm seven. I didn't have a dad, so all my coaches are dads. And I'd beaten up 11 of the 22 kids before training. I was a complete lunatic. He comes over to me, Gordon Casey. He's still alive today, Gordon. And he says, Aka, I'm sitting next to the point post. He's already upset with me. He said, mate, you cannot beat up these kids. And he said, listen, I'll give you some advice. If you want to play Aussie rules, he goes, look over here. And I look over him. He said, here's the boundary line. And, mate, if you can't kick left foot, then you're going to get stuck here, like a James Heard. You'd have to go back in, and, and that's what trouble is. You, but you can always get out of trouble if you've got a left foot. Well, of course, being all of seven and, of course, not having a dad, I'm like, that's brilliant. So from that moment on, I was always kicking, every second kick in, every drill, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. I'd always practice it, always train it. If I was doing stationary kicks, every kick would be alternating, every, you know, every second kick. So I, I just... I not only thought it was important, but by the time I was 12, I could kick 50 metres both ki- both feet. Like, that's a long distance. But you had to have power and timing. And no one really taught kicking, and they still really don't kick, teach kicking, particularly kids, because you get any Tom, Dick and Harry be a coach. And, of course, they're, they're just saying, oh, yeah, you kick all right, and whatever you got, you got. I just had a guy who I taught come through uh, last week, and it, we just did a session in here in my office, and he's 26, and he showed me some highlights, and as soon as I saw the highlights, I'm like, man, your hands are in the wrong position. That's that's why you can only kick good, medium, short kicks. He said, really? I said, look, and then we just quickly did some adjustments, and he's a really good uh, student, but he straight away got it. And now he can kick another 20, 25 metres further without much effort because he's got the hand in the right position, the, it's, the release is right, he can, he can get more torque in his kick and his leg action, Pew! Problem solved. Now, he's 26. He's missed. He has missed his opportunity. If he had got hold of me 10 years ago, we would have fixed that. Even you know, 12 years ago, and he would have probably made it because of his work ethic and the way he is. And I, I just cannot tell you how many times it is all in the hands, the hand position, the kicking, and the contact with the foot just comes. The the connection comes. It's it's literally the most uh, debilitating. A skill not to have to get to the highest level. I don't know how many blokes you see, you know, like Tom Scully, number one pick, all that sort of stuff. Terrible kick, terrible kick. Left foot kick, could only kick long, worked on his whole career. No one ever said to him, hey, mate, your hands are in the wrong position. You put them back here, you can kick good, medium, short, long. It, 
it staggers me, and it still staggers me to see coaches in the AFL. I don't know how they get jobs. They couldn't teach it if they tried. I agree, and hundred percent. I think it's it's a subjective topic because there's so many different elements to it. But you're spot on. I think it's um, you know too many people trying to complicate things or you know sort of overanalyze, and then as you said, fundamentals um, based around it. And that simple thing like as you said, with the hand to foot, hand to foot, hand to foot. I'm a huge believer of that, and I think the more you can practice that. So it sounds like obviously you picked up from the, just that young age and continually sort of practice it. Yeah, well, in the end, I, I had taught myself, but then once I had to then become a coach, or at least when I could teach others, it wasn't that difficult. And it's really the same problems. It's generally they try and grip it too hard. They have it too mm. low in the ball. They can on the panel on the front. They just need to bring Lift that up back up. Yeah. If they get that right, as fundamental as that is, they can then kick a forty-five degree angle kick because there's lots of different kicks you can do. But then they can easily move the hand down to do a ninety degree kick, like. It's so important just to get that one kick, uh, so that one part in the hand position right. So we'd always say, your errors are made, you kick with your hands. So you would make your mistakes with the hands, always. And so it doesn't matter if it's blind or gale, that hand to foot is just the most important part of all kicks. And these guys uh, just don't focus on it, and particularly at a young age where you can get that muscle memory going. It's like learning to, to hit a golf a golf ball at a young age you get this great mm. muscle memory you can keep it for the rest of your life mm-hmm. yeah absolutely and that's an i like how that process went for you learning to kick on your left foot like i think often when someone wants to improve something it seems like this big daunting goal that you've got to like put tons of hours of repetitive practice every day otherwise it's not going to happen but it could be something as simple as a little habit like you mentioned you kick every second ball on your left foot and you, you're going to go through the training sessions normally but if you add that habit to your existing sessions then you're going to develop it over time it doesn't have to be a big daunting task yeah yeah i had a you know when we had lee matthews just say the difference lee would always say don't try and impress me to kick left foot if you don't have it get back on your right so he would rather you make an error on your dominant foot than your non-dominant trying to be a hero obviously with me he's like well you know you don't have a dominant foot you just you just kick Mm -hmm. but you know he was always still he was a percentages man well if you're going to make errors do it on your dominant foot so you know different coaches different philosophies but for me whenever I coached uh, even seniors which I did for uh, five years I had to get guys who had to do a whole pre-season that's how long it took them to get out of these horrible habit they had for the last 20 years but it works and you could still do it now and, and to get a 26 year old still warms my heart that you can still change a kid at that level who's still not going to make it, but he's going to be a better player this year and he's going to get noticed and probably play a few of the Lions reserve games or, or somewhere really good. And that's, that's just from one, you know, one session with one kid that just never got a chance to get that type of coaching. Mm. It's a shame. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and mate, we've had some um, guests on the show who've um, we've had some interesting guests that have had like little superstitions in their, in their preparation, obviously. Um, keeping on the on the topic of preparation you want to prepare your skills so that you can go into those drills and 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 really challenge yourself but in terms of the um sort of left field preparation or searching for that extra one percent did you have anything that was a little bit um yeah a little bit left field that you did to improve your performance yeah well night game so i'd get my brother who's now a copper rory retardo as i call him but he's he, he would come down with me, or I'd grab my cousin who's the same age, and so about 11 before lunch, I'd go down and do a, uh, probably about 10, 15 minutes of kicking. Man, at night, it's just like, uh, just sharpened me right up. And that, that was not an odd thing to do, but certainly most people are trying to relax and not think about mm, footy. Yeah. So I would eat the same meal, and then I would have a snooze and go and play, depending on what time we played. So for me, uh, having a kick before the game, not at the venue outside mm-hmm. of the venue even before say grand final was very important i would just walk out i'd uh you know make sure my short kicks were just spot on and just do a little couple little uh, kicks i was going to need in the game just make sure everything was loose but you know i had the usual stuff probably like rainsy and my lucky jocks that ended up just fucking disintegrating <laughs> i don't know fucking where they went just went out the window had to find some other ones yeah i'd twice. always have my favorite togs uh i'd always get like this certain treatment before the game when I had my physio in. I was very structured before the game. And, and it worked fine for me, saved food. Marcus Ashcroft, for example, he used to leave at the exact same minute before a night game because he'd always play at 7.10. 
he would leave at like you know five thirteen to get there and and do his crazy, isn't it? And one day he let his wife drive, and his wife like Choppers is a complete thinker, like in our performance and our, uh, our psychology. So his wife, being a mozzie, of course, she's all over the shop. She leaves late. She doesn't give a crap. She's just there. She's in the moment. Well, she drove one day. That was it. Choppers played bad. Yeah. Said you're never doing it again. I'm driving every, and he did every game. <laughs> so amazing, I never let. Isn't it? Never let anyone else drive into the games. I'd be like upset at drivers or whatever, but that's okay. I was in control, and that's that's not just my personality, but that's the things we we end up sort of tweaking all the way through mm. our career. And I know where you start, the way you finish. I mean, they're mm. like still in crazy. Oh, shit. it's like crazy. Tapping their their locker four times. I'm like, man, that ain't gonna help you. Don't worry about that. Yeah, exactly. No, it's it's interesting. Some of the teammates, most some of the most extraordinary things I've seen in my time. But yeah, you get to a point I think where you go. Probably stick to two or three things instead of you know sort of uh, twenty or thirty. But mate, um, <laughs> we uh, recently watched you. You obviously uh, uh, sh- you were in this documentary, The Dynasty, um, recently with um, obviously talking about the the great dynasty, of the the Brisbane Lions. And fortunate enough, being a Queensland boy myself, um, got to watch that firsthand, and it was some of the best um, you know sort of memories for mine going to the Gab and watching you guys absolutely dominate. Um, there was a lot about Lee Matthews in that documentary and just what Lee sort of did. Um, we've got a lot of coaches that listen to this. Um, podcast too and obviously um you know incredible coach and and some of the you know things on that documentary they sort of um spoke about lee um for coach out there you know what did lee sort of uh you know do so well to get you guys to perform well the best thing about lee i always say he's consistent you could read him he never was inconsistent you wouldn't never know where you stood with him it was always it was pretty straight up uh the only time lee was probably a little bit funny with you if you were injured he wouldn't probably talk to you as much and he had to get better at that. But I think Lee's big thing was back in those days, he just kept it like he had five things. And I know listening to other players who were also brilliant in that era, say with a Kevin Sheedy, who would fill the whole board up, where Lee would just have five things. That was, uh, you know, get your head lower than theirs when you, so to win your own ball, tackle them and dump them. You could do that back then. And, you know, those first two things just set up your whole team. And the rest of it, is all about you know knowing your role, playing your role, real simple stuff, and accepting that that is your role for whatever period of the game, whether you're in the midfield or got to go back, do a defensive role, whatever it is, you you must commit to it. And I think, you know, the way Lee was, he certainly said to us, we no problem with our attacking side, we just got to be the, one of the best defences. And for us, he, his big thing was always tackling. You know, if we got over eighty percent, we pretty much never lost games. We did a lot of work, which is not really known that much, not just in wrestling, but in tackling technique. We'd always be working on technique, closing angles, how to sort of cut off players, particularly open field tackles. And even though we we're a big, strong, fast, you know, very endurance-based team, we still had this amazing ability to to shut down teams with our, our tackling pressure. And that was our big thing. And that's the reason we nearly lost that game in 2002 against Collingwood. Their tackling pressure was actually better than ours probably the only time in that four years that it was probably the case. So I always talk about those things with Lee. If you played well, you're going well, you get a pat on the back from Lee, that's about it. You're going well, keep it up. And if you weren't going well and you need a bit of a lift, like sometimes he'd, he'd call me in, he'd show me a highlight reel of what I've been doing. And you know, if you feel, oh, I'm not that bad after all. He goes, you can play and out you go. He'd come to me before games and say things like, I want to see a handstand today. We all knew what that meant. We're going to win at home. We're going to play well. And they're the little things that sort of... Lee's not quite renowned for any small talk. He's not really that kind of player. Uh, or sorry, person or coach. Gotcha. He was very much... Everything was about footy and everything was always... The conversation could start about anything. Boats, politics would always come back to footy. And that's, that's just Lee. Lee was just a fanatic about being... Your whole life was footy. And that was Lee. That's how he coached. Amazing. Some of the stories, obviously, I was there years later, mate, and, and Brownie and Blackie obviously were still around and Lukey and sort of these types. I heard a lot of those stories. Um, and one particular one, which I'm going to gonna ask, and I'm going to get the truth of this one, uh, there was a team meeting one day, a review, and Lee was highlighting the lack of contested ball and hard ball gets um, after a loss. He went around the room and each midfielder and he said highlighted you know, their, their, their lack or, or low numbers. When he got to you, um, you told him it was because you had low numbers because your your speed and how good you were with your pace, you turned hard balls into loose ball gets, um, and that was the reason your numbers were low. Is that is there any truth to that, mate? 
Well, I mean, I've heard... <laughs> it's funny, that story, because I don't remember it like they remember it, but I only remember it once he got to me. But he had gone through, he said, Vossi, you're usually getting uh, eight hardball gets a game and you're down at like four. And Vossi goes, well, I thought Blackie was going to do it. He says, well, Blackie, Blackie, you're usually at 10, and here you are at three this week. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, Lee, I thought Vossi was going to do it. And so he starts to go through the players, and, and he pulls up my numbers, and my hard ball gets normally would be, might be, say, four, and then my loose ball gets might be 10 or 12. And Lee goes, well, Aki, you've got no hard ball gets at all this week. We played Sydney, we got beaten, you know, this is, how could this be? And naturally, in my brain, I'm like, that is strange, Lee. And then I thought, but if you really think about it, Lee, as I sort of stopped for a second, I said, if you think about it, what I was doing, I was getting my pace. I said, because, you know, contestable hardball guess, there must be like a player around you. Is that, is that correct? And he goes, that's right. I said, well, there are players around, Lee, but by the time I get to the ball <laughs> and I disappear, I've turned that hardball get into a fucking loose ball get. <laughs> Let's go. I look behind me, the fucking <laughs> Scott brothers, uh, Litchi, Vossi, they're all rolling in the aisles. And I thought, oh, shit, did I just say that? that that's yeah, going to sound good. as arrogant as arrogant. But, you know, yeah, that's, well. that's the way I thought. Lee, to his credit, bad. just moved on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fair point. And off he went, something else. It's funny times. <laughs> you don't get you, so many great stories with Lee because he's just not – he's a humorous guy, but the stories. You know, they're even funny. If you could ever get around us, say, this year, we'll have another reunion, there will be like 20 blokes. Even I love their stories that they have about Lee and Boss, mm. but it's the funniest weekend, I tell you. You'd, you'd pay money to be there. <laughs> That's gold. And obviously that, um, that speed and, and, and obviously your skills as well held you in, in good, spe- uh, good stead for a um, really successful career. And that, that early 2000s period, you had a, um, a Brownlow in 2001, which was arguably your best year, and then... The triple, um, the, the triple premierships. What what did you do to ensure that you performed on the big stage, particularly that two thousand and three um, grand final against the Pies, where you kicked um, five goals too? With me and my speed, like uh, I, early in my career, I was getting a lot of hamstring problems, and I didn't recognise at the time. I didn't know what was going on, and this is a frustrating part of the first four years. But as you remember, Rainsy, what I was doing, I was getting stronger and bigger but of course there's more load on your legs so mm. naturally that's usually you have a soft tissue tissue injury it wasn't until victor popoff came and he said mate let's do a scan on your back he goes you got a spondylolisthesis which is a vertebrae moves forward and that that cause that goes on to where your your nerves are and that causes this irritation which then makes the hamstrings really twingy and often tear so he could he could uh, he would go through before games he would go through the front where your belly button is and push that spine back in so, so it wouldn't move out. And there was a number of players that had that. Well, that nearly fixed uh, my hamstring problems there and then. But then another couple of things happened. I got a hamstring strengthening machine, which, which really strengthened my hammy, so that was super strong. And then I worked out, and Victor would say, mate, if your glutes are tight, your back gets tight, your hamstrings go. So every week, as, as bad as it sounds, I'd always have one of the – uh, rubbers at the club or the physio just strip my glutes like they would just get rid of any tightness because the glute is the biggest muscle but for me it's the most important thing to be flying so then my back issues went and my hamstring issues went that first half of nine, uh, 2001 like I carried that midfield we weren't winning much and we come good and the boys took over the back end wasn't as as good as I would have liked but you know it's a great period but 2004 like up until a couple of years ago that was that was a outstanding year I was pretty much um I was number one in the whole league, set the record for the inside 50s. Uh, I think Dangerfield might have broken that. I think they played an extra two games, but who's counting? And we we had this, and I was so dominant. I think the next best in that whole, uh, of the whole competition was actually a team. So, you know, that was an outstanding year, but that was more about me getting more in the midfield. And I, and I like that year 2004 because it's not 2001, 2 and 3 where you, you're winning flags, you're getting tagged. You're already a good player and you're playing multiple years of good years and then you put in another outstanding year. And in 2005, we were starting to drop away, but I still won the best and fairest that year. Only the second one I won. So even in 2001, I wasn't quite uh, good enough to get the chocolates yet. I looked back and then the guys, the three guys who beat me was uh, Simon Black, Brownlow medalist and uh, Hall of Famer, Michael Voss, Brownlow medalist, Hall of Famer, and Nigel Lappin. Hall of Famers. So, you know, you get beaten out, you win a brown line, you can't win your own best and fairest, but you get beaten out by three Hall of Famers. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. 
Pretty amazing, mate. And that and that side just through those premiership years. Was there any sort of um, you know thing you sort of reflect on? Now? Obviously, you said you've got your um, you, you sort of your catch ups and things like that. But what was so different to to those sort of sides and than sort of others that you sort of reflect um, on now? The psychology. Yeah, we just had a pro. We had the best in the business. A guy called Dr. Phil Jauncey. Man, we wouldn't have won anything without him. I'm telling you. Like we had a great coach. So he was the, he was the Moz enforcer, that sort of that personality yeah. type. Yep. Yeah. So you, you actually get there's like four types, main types, but you always get pairs and triangles. So you got a Mozzie enforcer. So you see a lot of Mozzie enforcers and a lot of Mozzie thinkers in football. It's always the way it is. A lot of captains are thinker enforcers. So Vossi, Lynchy, a lot of coaches are thinkers enforcers, like Lee Matthews and. And say uh, even Wayne Bennett, identical pretty much in their profiles, thinker and forces. So when they coach, they're way more thinker. And so Lee and Wayne would never talk to us and was told, don't ever talk to the team straight after a loss because you'll be angry and you'll say things that you shouldn't say. You wait five minutes and they calm down and then they get the structure out and this is what we need to do, we need to do this better. And they became brilliant coaches because they didn't lose the group, unlike when Lee was at Collingwood, which he eventually met, I, I just lost the group. And so... That pairs and triangles and understanding, and he had our wives do it as well. So we, I, I still use it every day. I use it in all the businesses I've ever been in, uh, every group I've ever been involved in. I, I can see what's going on and, and see what types they are, and I'll know straight away. So when I coach, I would never have a Nigel Lappin, who's a feeler thinker, start in the middle of the ground because he's going to take five minutes to warm up to a game. He's always like that. Ten minutes in, and Nigel's starting to hum along. Where your mozzies and enforcers like... Simon Black's just a pure mozzie. So he's going to buzz around. He just needs to be in the action. Uh, Justin Lepper says the mozzie enforcer. But those types, you want in the middle of the ground because they are so physical and they just love it. They, they love being in the action, love causing chaos. They're the guys you put in. You make them change and then you get the other guys in. So I would structure my team around that. So when people talk about that era, we had like uh, 13, no, sorry, 16 of the 21 players were either enforcer, Moz, uh, sorry, enforcer thinkers or enforcer mozzies. You have no idea what kind of chaos they are because enforcers are notoriously just big picture, don't give a real rat's ass about what you think. Incredibly, uh, they want to argue. They're very physical They are just, and they're always in your face. You can imagine 16 of them. Like there would not be a training session in the Brisbane Lions in that era that there wasn't a punch on somewhere and you know, someone would be punching leper and then Pike would be punching leper and then I'd be punching leper. Like, it, it just it just would happen every week. Scott Brothers would be over there arguing with someone else or themselves. And then, you know, just always, always up for a fight or an argument. So to have Lee understand all the psychology, but then have Phil constantly mm. having the input, just calm the group down. Every time we went into big games, no fanfare. So it just got to be like a normal home and right, way around. So you never saw balloons. You never see them at the Broncos. You never see any of this. We're in a grand final crap. No. Nah. Business as usual, boys, mm. and that's that set us apart, I believe. And I, th- I th- always felt not just physically but mentally, we always had another gear. Where Port Adelaide, who were a great team in that era, just never had that extra little bit that you're always like, oh, you mm. don't know if they can lift it and, and go again. Incredible, isn't it? We talk again, talk a fair bit about skill and development, all sorts of stuff, and, and f- physical stuff. I just think that mental sort of thing, just that it's that sort of um you know the cream on top i obviously got the skill and talent which you guys did but that that sort of mental side i think is is massive and huge and obviously that prolonged success it sort of comes with that mate um and then just sort of moving on to that sort of oh five oh six period when you were finishing up on in the line at the lines and and um you know there's a lot of media hype around you know potential strain relationships and all that sort of stuff What's your, what's your sort of take on that and, and for our listeners, you know, sort of leaving the club and then heading to the dogs in, in sort of 07? Yeah, it was uh, 2005, a great year. I win the best and fairest. I'm playing in the midfield more, but our team is on, on the decline, mainly because if you look at the guys who retired in that short period, you know, from Lynchy, the, obviously Chopper's finished, Marcus Ashtore finished after the third one, but we had Sean Hart and Michael Voss and Justin Lewis all leaving at least sort of either at 2000, in 2006 or before. Like we, lo- we lose thousands of games of talent and uh, experience and you just can't replace that. It's just nothing you can do quickly. For me, as uh, w- wanting to win premierships, it was a very difficult period. And, of course, naturally I'm thinking, well, can I go somewhere else? And then, you know, th- 
the reality of what I did, which was the wrong thing, it was being a coach like Lee, Lee would always sort of, him and I had a great relationship for a long time. We needed to because I was in the media at that stage. Before I started, it was only him. So it had worked as a good relationship. But when it went sour, it was, it was me just basically uh, publicly after round one, 2006, just saying, well, we need to change our game plan because they were rotating through the benches and stuff. They're doing all these really, really new things that were causing us a lot of grief. And to put that in my column, my first round of that year, uh, you know, I thought he would take it the way it should be, like constructive criticism. But, you know, when you're a coach at that level, you're just better off talking about it privately. I uh, probably arguably learned the, the biggest lesson in my life, which is, uh, you know, it would turn out that, that I was correct and I can be correct all day. But in the end, to ever question a guy that standing at that time, that was a bad idea. Criticism is every human always does the same thing. They try and justify themselves to the end of the earth. And that was the end, beginning of the end. So by the end of the year, middle of the year, I think I'd, I'd played, I'd, I'd sort of come back. I had a hamstring tendon issue. The only two times I ever got injured uh, bad enough that I couldn't come back and just dominate, I got sacked both times. Oh, bad timing. Maybe it was the gods trying to help me. But I, I we just played against uh, North Melbourne down there, kicked three goals, helped us win the game. Then an issue happened with the media. And Lee and I had already agreed, look, at the end of the year, let's try and do a trade and and I'll leave. But by now, Lee, just, he just couldn't stand anymore. He was doing his press conferences. Everybody questions about me. What's going on? All this crap. And he had enough. I had enough. So Lee said, mate, that's it. I said, no worries. So we ended up, that was it. I get sacked. And then I sort of got a little bit lucky to go to the Bulldogs. I did have uh, Essendon who were offering me a two-year deal, but Bulldogs had a three-year deal. I was 30, turning 30. So, of course, naturally, you want a bit more security and more money. And there's a guy called Darren Creswell, who was a famous Sydney player, but he was one of our assistant coaches. He got on really well with Rocket Ede, and he was probably the reason I, I got over the line at the Bulldogs because of his relationship with Rodney Ede. I did have a chance to probably go to Essendon, but I was worried they're going to sack Kevin Sheedy. They ended up doing that the following year. And I did have a chance to go to Geelong, but we couldn't wa- quite work out the deal, and they went on to win another three flags after mm-hmm. that. And it would have been nice to have six, but... It, that their cap was not really going to fit what I wanted at that time, yeah. and and I wanted to be in Melbourne, not Geelong. I mean, who would? Shit, no, exactly. I going to go to Geelong. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> and played some reasonable footy there, mate. The dogs sort of finishing up their twilight of your career there, and you know, sort of enjoyed your time and no regrets. No, not really. I mean, I, I sort of was leading goal kicker two thousand nine, so I had a really good year. I don't know how I didn't make small four all Australian, uh, probably because I was in the press all the time back in the AFL because they had Andrew <laughs> Demetrio who's a complete idiot running the show back then. Oh my God, what an idiot. But I think I think I hurt myself by being so vocal. Mm. Up here, you, you could say all the same things and they never hear about it because they're not really that, that worried. But yeah, you criticise City Hall, that's what's going to happen. So yeah, I think uh, then Barry Hall came 2010 and my goals just dried up. And by the middle of the year, I had a couple of run-ins with a couple of senior players and yeah, they were just soaking it up a bit, and I was not really gonna. I didn't want to. Uh, I wasn't gonna take it. And they had a couple of them, you know, completely cracked the sads over this column I did, this gay column, which was not really a big thing now, but back then it was, you know, big mm. news. And they changed my column, and all this shit went on anyway. These uh, leadership, I got. My problem was I got the A team, the leadership team of the Bulldogs. I didn't have them on side. That was it. I was gacking. Yeah. Yeah. So I get sacked. I think I got sacked uh, on the 22nd of July. I got sacked on the 21st of July from Brisbane. So July has been a great month. July. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, great month, July. Shit month. And that was it. My career was over. Now, okay, mate, um, looking to the, the, the coaching now, so obviously on the platform, um, uh, sort of mentoring and coaching young players as they come through their journeys. Um. In a, in a very broad sense, what's some advice that you might have for young players um, coming through the ranks and, and, and wanting to get drafted one day? Get on the platform, find a good coach, listen. You'll get so much out of that. One-on-one, even a- any coaching, a good coach, yeah, you, you pay some, some money for them, but it's their time. And the experience that myself or Rainsy or Josh Frazier or any of these guys can give you can be just, just exactly what you need. I don't need to give you all the things I'd be telling you now, I would tell you privately, but, mm. you know, they're generally coming to help with their game. So, you know, I help their kicking the hardest part. Uh, but there's so many facets that we can improve on, you know, diet these days. I mean, it's what I do now is decades ahead of what we did back then and still mm. in front of like 
a lot of the AFL systems now. So, you know, there's lots of things to being a good athlete. There's nothing like just the want, the will. I have three daughters, the youngest one. She's the only one with that will that she just, I mean, she beats the sisters up. She just wants to win. She's aggressive. She, yep. She's just born like that, as I was, as you were, Rainsy. I mean, you yeah. come from, you, you come from the, the opposite side. You've got a famous father that played. Well, I had no father to look up to, mm. so I, I still had the same will that you had, but you still got to do it. So you can have a thousand athletes come to us, but, you know, that one little, just that, that grinding determination to get it done, and that can come from lots of sources. I, it's hard to know that that guy's going to make it, that guy's not. I mean, I was pick whatever, Rangers pick whatever. You can't tell me that the guys who were picked in front of me, that they didn't have better careers, but they didn't realise that I had way more improvement in, in my athletic ability and the teams I was in, which helps, uh, become a better player and my career ends up you know, being pretty good. So they're, they're all great questions to ask, but... You know, for any coach, if he says, oh, we'll do this and do that, you'll be a superstar. In the end, it's the whole package. And we can only really see it unless they come to us. We're probably not going to be able to help. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're a player and you'd like to connect with um, with Aka, you can book a private session um, with him by going to oneononefootball.com.au and searching for our Queensland-based coaches. Um, and if you're not in Queensland, you can still pick his brains from afar by booking a virtual coaching session through our platform. We have, Aka, that, that's, we have that now? Yeah, we, we do, actually. Man, a bit of virtual to, coaching. Uh, that's great get, for mentoring. That'd be good. Yeah, that'd be much it, easier for me. I don't have a lot of oh, time. Zoom and, yeah. That's all right. We can fix anything. We, can, we just need videos of your kicking or whatever. We'll fix it. It's not that hard. Absolutely. Aka, any final words, mate, before we wrap up? Yeah, excuses are for losers. Just remember that. I always say that to my staff. Excuses are for losers. Oh, I can't come in today. Oh, this is it. going on. Why are you late? Oh, the traffic was bad. Excuses are for losers. Never let them in. Oh. Mate, love thanks. Love thanks so much, mate. It's unbelievable content there. And, um, yeah, just giving up your time to jump on board today. No problem. Always happy to help, Rainsy. And uh, keep it going, boys. Great platform. And if you haven't used it, use it. You'll become a better athlete, a better footballer, I tell you. Thanks, mate. Beautiful. Thanks, mate. Thanks, boys. Thanks for listening to the One on One Football Podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at oneononefootball.com.au. Thanks guys, we'll see you for the next episode.